okay? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Storage, the podcast. With me, Libby Higgins. I'm the host of this. I'm hosting it. I'm doing the hosting of this podcast. I am the host. Hopefully I'm not blocking storage because that would be irritating. Love when I play a sound effect and don't have the volume up. Man, that's not the one I wanted. It is super cold in here today. It uh, is probably 30 to 40 degrees and I have my electric blanket and my heater. So I'm ready. As you notice, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, look at that blouse she has on. It is really fancy. And it is fancy. But I want you to know that I got it at um, Walmart.com, not in the store. I had to go to Walmart.com to get this blouse. It's really incredible. I think that um, orange is my color. It really brings out the rosacea in my face. But I like it. And I will continue to go to Walmart.com and purchase clothing if I need it. This week on the podcast, I have a couple things I want to talk about. Um, Obviously, I want to thank Officer Daniels for being here last week. Even though I deleted the video file and you didn't get to see me the whole time, lots of positive comments for OD. Man, I got a lot of spit in my mouth. I apologize. Whew. Let me bring this. Let me bring this up a little bit more. Let me bring this up here to get my midsection warm. First thing. Um, I want to talk about, well, actually the second thing, the first thing I talked about was my blouse. And if you say blouse instead of shirt or top, I commend you because blouse is a hilarious word. But it's not as funny as slacks. Slacks is probably one of the best words in the world. Well, billfold is. Billfold is a great word. Slacks is a great word. Coin purse is also a great word. Um, Pocketbook, that's another great word. Pocketbook. I have my pocketbook. Speaking of pocketbooks, folks, um, (laughs) we have a new voicemail. And I have to look at the number because I can't remember it. But got some voicemails that came in. What is my voicemail? Well, don't know. Honestly, I have to look on my podcast internet site. God, these are filthy. If you want to call into the podcast, the podcast number is... (laughs) Hold on a second. It is 615 200 7193. I am not taking live calls, but I do listen to the voicemails. And why don't I just go ahead and play one right now? Because it made me laugh so hard. Yeah, I was looking for a storage facility that is at least a 10 by 10 insulated with a um, light bulb that is in use. If you have one available, please call me back. Not sure who sent that, but it's hysterical because on the voicemail I say, hi, you've reached storage, leave a message. And this person is either a comedian part-time influencer, because that is hilarious. Hi, I'm looking for a storage facility that is these, at least 10 by 10 that has a light bulb, because guess what? Light bulb still isn't working. That's a callback, folks. Whoever that was from a 541 number, I commend you. 
because that is hysterical. Just so many, just really, really nice. I'm going to listen to Nick's. Nick is from 937. He left about eight messages. So let's see what Nick has to say. Hey, Libby, this is Nick from Dayton. I hope you're having a great day. I just had a quick story to tell you. By the way, I am having a great day. Thank you. One time I went to Chicago, and uh, we decided to take the train from the airport to where we were staying. So we get downtown, and uh, we get off the train, and as soon as we get off the train, we're walking down the street, and this lady in front of us pulls her panties off while she's walking, walks on the road, or on the sidewalk, and takes us off. Right there. Uses her panties to wipe her butt, throws them in a bush, and keeps walking with her boyfriend. All of that happened in under 30 seconds, and she did it right next to a bunch of people that were eating in, like, some kind of, like, sidewalk, like, patio dining area. So, I just thought you would enjoy that one. Anyway, I love you, and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Okay. Hey, Libby. Uh, thanks for that story, Nick. Um, I'd like to give that lady props for using her resources that she had at the time, and that was her underwear, uh, to wipe her butt. Also, her resources were the outdoors. She did. <laughs> she apparently had to use it and didn't have anywhere to go. So, I've been in that situation many a time where I've had to go and. Uh, may or may not have pooped in my pants. <laughs> now, we get vulnerable on this podcast, but that was a little extra vulnerability that y'all didn't need to bo- know about. Yeah, I've pooped my pants before, so what? Don't act like you have it pooped in your pants as an adult. <clears throat> so those are the kind of voicemails that are coming in, coming in hard and fast, like that lady that had apparently an IBS attack and needed to go to the restroom on the ground in front of a dining area. Now, I would have at least walked across the street to make sure there wasn't people eating. Maybe, a, I don't know, a pet store or a library. Those seem like okay places to use the bathroom. Not in front of someone eating. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And I've always heard, oh, poop particles will fly in the air, so don't put your toothbrush anywhere out on your sink. Well, I don't. I keep it in a nice cabinet, so a poop particle will not get on my toothbrush. So if you come over and use my bathroom, and you're thinking you're going to spread a poop particle from here to there to everywhere, you're not going to. Now, are poop particles on my perfume and... My face wash and everything else, yeah, but at least it's not going in my mouth. How did we start this already talking about poop? (sighs) As a kid, my sister and I and brother, everything was always about poop. It didn't matter. It was about poop and bee holes, and it was constant, you know. We'd call each other a doo-doo butthole or a doo-doo head. That was the most extreme insult you could give to a sibling. Calling them a doo-doo butthole? (laughs) You kidding me? You weren't calling them the A word or the F word or the... Any other bad derogatory term? You called them a doo-doo butthole. And we did that so much, in fact, that one of my dad's friends, Daryl... Not to be confused with Tammy's husband, Daryl, called us the doo-doo butthole family. Disgusting. And up until about, I don't know, three years ago, anytime I was anytime I was turned away from my sister, my sister would take her finger, no matter what I was doing, but especially if I was bent over or walking up steps, would take her finger and put it right in 
my crack where my bee hole would be. And then I would go, whoa. So I finally had to tell my sister, please stop placing your finger near my bee hole when I'm walking. Whoa, somebody's coming in next door. I wonder what they're doing over there. <laughs> yeah, so I finally had to tell my sister, stop putting your finger near my butthole. It makes me uncomfortable. And she finally did. But she said, I can't help it. I, every time I see your butt, I want to do that. Doo-doo butthole family. It probably also had to do with the... F- Now, my family and I are disgusting. Like many families have disgusting rituals or, what's it called, traditions. Another tradition that we had when we were smaller kids is, <laughs> and this is embarrassing, um, but we, so we had a, an uncle and his name was Buddy Ray. A lot going on over there. His name was Buddy Ray. And Buddy Ray at the time was very rich owned his own bar, and could pretty much afford anything that he wanted at any time. So we just thought that was really fancy. So what my brothers and sisters would do was take our finger and place it near our butt crack. And um, I'm already regretting telling the story. And then say to a sibling, hey, just got some of Buddy Ray's new perfume. Would you like to smell it? And then the sibling would then put their finger (laughs) by the other sibling's nose. And the sibling would take a sniff and realize that it had an aroma that was not a perfume at all. And say, oh, you're disgusting. But the thing is about this tradition of my family is that every time we fell for it, we fell for it every time. We knew that we weren't going to smell a nice, fragrant perfume. We knew we were going to smell stank. But we continued to do it for many years. And I can't believe it. We knew what was going to be on that finger. So my question is, why did we do that? I knew there was not going to be perfume, especially on the end of a finger. You spray perfume on a wrist, on a neck, on a shirt. Maybe if you're feeling really frisky, you spray it in your under regions. But for many years, we continued to smell Buddy Ray's perfume. And I've probably revealed one of the most secretive secrets of my whole childhood. If I ever come up to you in the wild and I say, hey, would you like to (laughs) smell Buddy Ray's perfume? Don't do it. Or if my sister or brother come up to you and say that, 100% do not do it. I'm just going to tell you, it's not going to be perfume. Also, why would Buddy Ray be buying perfume? He would buy a cologne, maybe. Sounds like someone's doing some kind of mechanical work next door. That's cool. (laughs) Oh, God. We're disgusting. Please tell me in the comments if you and your family did... Anything disgusting like that. And I'm just going to go ahead and not talk about disgusting stuff anymore. I'm going to tell you a different story. So, and this just happened. Um, When I was about 15 years old, my mother and stepfather took me aside and told me that As a 16-year-old girl, my mother was forced to give a child up for adoption. She had an unwed, unwanted pregnancy. And um, 
basically her parents, my grandparents, sent her away to a home for unwed pregnant mothers. And this was in the 60s. Apparently, being pregnant in the 60s when you're not married and 16 is very shameful. And I can see how my grandmother, who wasn't always the nicest person, would find my mom getting pregnant extremely shameful. Now, my mother didn't speak on it much, but I know that every year... On the child's birthday, which was in May, um, she would become very depressed, sad. Do I go next door and tell them to stop making so much noise? I'm trying to do a podcast over here. Apparently, my mom never really got over having to give up that child. And I can't imagine um, being 16 in the 60s, pregnant having my grandparents as your parents and then being forced to give away your baby. I can't imagine how awful that was for my mother. So adoption records, records of course, are, you know, hard to find. So when the Internet first really started booming, I would get on adoption sites like adoption forums, and write everything that I knew about the baby, which basically was the birthday that she was female and she was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and never heard anything. I may have known the initials of what my mom named the baby. Then cut to DNA technology. I did 23andMe, also did Ancestry, hoping that she would pop up on my relatives. Nothing for so long, right? Lots of second cousins, lots of eighth, ninth, tenth cousins. Basically, you're not even related at that point as far as I'm concerned. So last week, my sister sends me a screenshot of a message that she got, and it said, um, I'm looking for relatives of Carol Ann, who was my mother, Um, I was, um, born to your mother. Your mom is my biological mom and she stated her name and then immediately I'm flipping out, you know, losing my mind. So my sister and I started looking on Facebook with the name of, of the, um, person that she gave the first maybe three to four people um (laughs) were people that were extremely religious and I'm not talking just like Hail Mary full of grace I'm talking they were pastors and wives of pastors and I thought that's great if that's my sister but my sister won't um (laughs) approve of my lifestyle (laughs) So finally, my sister sent me a screenshot of a a woman with a picture of a man, and it said, I'm adopted. And as soon as I saw this woman's eyes, I was like, that is my sister. That's my sister. So I took her number down and um, texted her. It was late. It was like maybe 10.30 at night. And I said, hello. Um, Told her what my name was. Said, I'm reaching out to you on behalf of my sister and myself. And um, would you like to be in contact? And then I said, I've been looking for you for a long time, which I had been. And it took her, I, she must have went to bed because it took her to the next day to answer me. And then we set up a little phone call the same day and talked for about two hours. <clears throat> and I basically, you know, just made sure to tell her 
from from everything that I know, my mom did not want to give you up. And um, every day on your birthday, she would be very sad that she had to give you up. And my sister, I say my sister, uh, my sister, said that she um, had a really great life and never wanted to look for her biological parents. <clears throat> but she had seen a documentary about adoption and how they were stealing babies in Tennessee, and she wanted to make sure that wasn't her, basically. So that led her down the path of finding me and um, my sister, um, it's, it's absolutely incredibly wild to see another adult that you've never met who looks exactly like your mother and exactly like you. And we basically just caught up as much as we could in those couple of hours. And we have set up a meeting. We're going to meet in a couple of weeks. Just her and I, my sister, my other sister, Lee, has something else going on. Um, but I made sure to tell her that everyone in our family is insane. And she said she was too, so that's good. Everyone in our family is insane. It's wild. It's wild. I have a sister. But then I'm thinking... I have enough trouble keeping up with my one sister. And now I'm going to be keeping up with two sisters. (sighs) Whoa. So basically I've just been sending her pictures of mom. And and I, I feel a little bit of guilt. I feel guilty that I got to grow up with, with our mother and she didn't even though it's out of my control, out of her control, out of my mom's control, basically, I do feel guilt uh, that I was able to to, um, experience our mother. Man, the 60s were wild, dude. Just sending a teenager away, taking their baby away, I mean, I don't know if my mom would have even been able to take care of her, so that was probably great that she did give her up for adoption, but <clears throat> she was sent uh, away at six months. So my sister, I'm not going to say her name for privacy reasons because I haven't told her that I was going to talk about this, and also um, she's not on social media like I am, so she's hasn't been exposed to... Um, you know, a lot of what can happen online. Once you say it, that's it. <clears throat> so for her privacy, I'm not going to say her name or birthday, but um, I will ask her if I can share a picture. What's happening over there? Wild. She actually looks very much like my uncle, my mom's brother. And his name is Barry. <laughs> And we call him the bear man because he's not, um, he's not a good guy. Not a good guy, bear man. He's a kind of a derelict, as I like to say. Man, my voice is very scratchy today. Let me take a drink of my not sponsored Sonic drink. Need to stop smoking. That's what I need to do. So that is just some very exciting news that I wanted to share with you all. And of course, when I get her consent, I will share her with you if she wants. She said she wanted to come to a show. I've also been in contact with her daughter, who is my niece. I have another niece and a nephew who are grown-ups. And the, my niece said, I'd seen you online and stuff, and it's really weird that you're my, you're my aunt. 
<laughs> Imagine finding out your aunt is the McRib lady. <laughs> Oh, I'm dead. <coughs> I'm dead, dude. Imagine finding out your aunt is not only the McRib lady, but does um, videos in her car with a skeleton, with a wig on, and glasses. So that's cool. <laughs> I have a sister. I have a sister. Wild. It's wild. That's right, folks. It's wild. <laughs> they can't stop. They just can't stop laughing. Let's listen to another uh, one of these voicemails I got in here. I'm not listening to another Nick voicemail. He sent enough to last me the year, and that's fine. Send as many as you want, Nick. Whoops, just moved it to trash. Didn't mean to, swear to God. See, I'm trying not to put on my glasses. I'm trying to be, you know, cool and hip, but I can't see. <clears throat> Hello, I was just on Instagram and I saw your post. Oh, this is really nice. See, it gives me a little transcription. Hello, I was just on Instagram and I saw your post for the storage podcast voicemail and I just wanted to call and say how much I enjoy you and your YouTube videos and I just appreciate you so much for making me laugh and being so funny and talented. And um, I just uh, hope to continue to see you do many more new exciting things. And hopefully one day if you and Chelsea Lynn end up being able to come to Arizona to do a show, I would love to see you live. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful day. And uh, God bless you and yours and um keep on keeping on okay bye bye that'll do i feel like somebody just said that'll do Hello. me at the end and i don't know where that came from that'll do me thank you for your message that was very nice i feel a little bit embarrassed playing these nice messages where everybody's like you're really nice I feel a little bit embarrassed <laughs> Because my brain, this is what I had to do. <clears throat> Sorry, I keep clearing my throat. I, when I would get a compliment in previous years of my life, someone would say, hey, that was a really great set, or you look pretty. Not only would I disagree with them verbally, I would then argue with them. Why would you do that? If somebody says, hey, you're pretty, I would say, no, I'm not, or something else ridiculous. So then I had to start tricking myself. Well, not tricking myself, but I had to tell my brain, stop arguing with these people. They're saying nice things to you. Don't argue with them. So then anytime I would get a compliment, I would simply say, thank you, and not... Uh, try to have my brain arguing with me about it. At some point, you're supposed to just be able to get a compliment. And if somebody says you're beautiful, you say, yeah, I know. <laughs> Duh. No, not for real. So uh, immediately my brain goes into, they're not telling the truth. They're telling you a lie. Well, why would they lie? That's silly. Just say thank you. Somebody says, hey, you, not, you got a nice butt. Say, I know. <laughs> if somebody says to you, hey, um, your, your breath doesn't stink. Say thank you. And then maybe get to the root of why 
they would have said your breath stinks. Maybe you had stinky breath before and you don't anymore. And that's good. Accepting compliments is very hard. And I think that is for anybody who's not um, a narcissist, maybe. <laughs> it's hard to near, hear nice things when your brain is, has been wired for whatever reason. If, if growing up people said to you negative things or I, I, don't, I don't know what the reason. But if your brain is wired to automatically say no or try to talk somebody out of compliment, um, every time you get a compliment, you have to stop. First, you have to stop your brain. You have to say, just stop whatever it is you're about to say. Because my brain's going to say, that's not true. They're lying. Why is my brain like this? What happened to me? <laughs> so I think that's a really good improvement in not only my mental health, but just my overall well-being, accepting compliments and possibly agreeing with them. Hey, you had a good set. Thank you so much, which I genuinely, genuinely mean. But then I'm thinking, hey, my set was pretty good. And that's okay to think that. There's a lot of things that I had to trick my brain about. And I, I, I kind of um, hate talking about tricking my brain because it sounds like it almost sounds like I'm talking about two different entities. My brain is my brain. It's all one big thing. But there's a side of my brain, and I don't know which side it is, which has a lot of negative self-talk. And learning how to ignore that, that, um, that voice... Because I don't know that it's going to go away. I don't know if it's a component of my OCD or what it is. But learning to tell that part of my brain, look, um, what you're saying is not valid. It's destructive. I don't like it. Please stop. Because it's harmful. <clears throat> I think maybe therapy would <laughs> help me get to the root of why my brain automatically goes to the negative. <clears throat> so the a caveat is this of this is that I was on stand up on the spot with Jeremiah Watkins in St. Louis. Greatest thing I've ever done, scariest thing I've ever done. Can't remember if I've talked about it. Well, Jeremiah sent me the the recording of it because he puts it on YouTube. I watched the video and I felt so cringy. I thought it was bad. I thought I cussed too much. I thought I was visibly nervous. And I didn't even message Jeremiah back. Have I talked about this? I can't remember. I'll just talk about it again. Didn't message him back because I was hoping it would just go away. He messaged me a few days later, hey, did you get a chance to look at your set? <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I'm being too hard on myself, but I didn't like it. I don't know why anyone was laughing. And um, I didn't really want him to post it. He said he wouldn't if I didn't want him to. And I sat with that for a while. <clears throat> just as I did when he asked me, I sat with it. And I just said, you can post it. But I did not want to see any of the comments because I knew I was going to get roasted. Cut to it coming out and people that weren't even fans of me people that weren't even fans of me were coming to my profile to say, hey, your set was really good. Now I can understand people that are fans of me saying, hey, you had a good set because they like me and you know they want to make me feel good. But people that I didn't even know were coming to my profile to say that it was a good set. And uh, 
that make me that made me really reconsider my initial thoughts and I think I really was being hard on myself because it is difficult to go up on a stage ask someone for a suggestion and then be funny about it I could do that all day in real life get me up on a stage and that's when it's scary and knowing that it was being filmed and being on YouTube not on my channel on someone else's channel where many other people that don't know me could see it um, <laughs> made it super scary. And I told Chelsea not to watch it. Wouldn't even let Chelsea watch it. Wouldn't let Tina watch it before it was put out because I, I just was like, it's, it just made me feel so... And the only word I can think of is icky. Like, I was embarrassed. I'm like, I know I can do better than this. And I probably could have done better, maybe with um, maybe different suggestions that inspired different stories. But with what I got, um, I think I, reviewing it, I think I did fine. And I'm not a, a pro a pro comic. I'm eight years in. That's not considered pro. But considering my experience, how nervous I was, the situation, I think... Looking at it again, I did okay. And I have to figure out a way to not be so hard on myself. Why are we so hard on ourselves? Doesn't make sense. It's just, I think it's because I want to put out something that that is good and that people will enjoy. And I wasn't sure if people were going to enjoy that, even if, People at the show seem to enjoy it. And I'm not saying this because I'm fishing for compliments and, and don't go watch it and then come back and say, hey, I heard what you said. Don't do that. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I'm trying to be really introspective about why I'm so hard on myself. I need to cut myself some slack. We probably all do. It's hard going up on a stage with nothing. Let's say you're a, a businessman. Let's say you work, you're an accountant, right? And you have to go give an accountant meeting. And in the meeting, your staff members are going to yell out suggestions. Hey, talk about 10 key calculators. Talk about uh, file folders. And then you have to come up with stuff right on the spot. Never mind that, that the whole whole room of your staff is looking at you waiting for information. That's probably not a good analogy, but with my experience, the situation, the cameras, it was fine. It was not as, as bad as I thought it was. Would I put it out as a special on Netflix? No, but for what it is, stand up on the spot where you're just doing stand up on the spot, it was fine. And just as good as anybody else's. Now Rafe Williams killed it. And if we're having to compare, which we shouldn't because we were all working, Rafe was great. Everybody was great on the show. I'm just sweet, you know, I got a sweeter heart for Rafe because he's my friend. Zach did well. Everybody did well. River did well. Everybody did great. So if you want to, go check that out. It's on YouTube. Stand up on the spot, Jeremiah Watkins. And what an incredible show to make to grow as a comedian. Stand up on the spot. What a great idea. Shout out to Jeremiah. What a great idea for a show. stinks in here <laughs> harry told me to get an air freshener for in here and i'm like you've only been in here once does it stink some other exciting news that i would like to share some of you may have seen i got a commercial with crystal restaurant they called me and said hey we have this idea for a commercial and i'm in my head i'm thinking Oh, cool, this will be online. That's awesome. And she said, no, this is going to be on TV. 
So in your homes, some of you may have a thing that is a rectangle, use a remote and turn it on. That's called a TV. Well, I'm on there. <laughs> and I have been on TV before with um, Rock This Boat, a reality show. But people sending me screenshots or videos of me appearing on their TV at random times is mind-blowing. And I can't believe it. And I couldn't tell anyone, of course, before it happened. So that was really hard to not talk about it. I went the day after Christmas or the 27th to Atlanta. They flew me to Atlanta. And I will tell you that my airline flight and my hotel was inclusive of my bag. As it should be. Went to Atlanta. A fancy car picked me up. Took me to my hotel, and I'm like, who am I? This man was holding a sign that said Libby Higgins, not spelled correctly, but I knew it was for me. Actually, he wasn't holding it. He had it in the front of his vehicle. And then the following day, we went to a crystal in Atlanta where they treated me like uh, a queen. Didn't really have to even lift a finger. Shot the commercial, and then came home uh, that day. It was fast and wild, and the commercial itself is very fast. <clears throat> the concept was this person is r rushing to get to uh, a, a commercial, to shoot a commercial, but they're stopping me at Crystal to get their new Sunriser sandwich, and that, I guess I can say, is sponsored because... They paid me to, to make that commercial. The nicest group of people. The crew was great. Everyone was great. And um, so the concept was, oh, I show up late and everybody's waiting for me. And I'm like, what? Which was something that I would do. <laughs> Let's be honest. Many a time when I worked at the school, I would be late but show up with a McDonald's Coke and coffee in hand. So if, maybe if I hadn't stopped and got those, would I be on time? I don't know. There got to be a point in my lateness where I'm like, look, I'm already 15 minutes late. What's 15 minutes more? I need to get a Coke and a coffee. So that's cool. This commercial runs for seven weeks. So if you live in an area that has Crystal Burger, as I like to call it, Crystal Burger, look on your TV. You might see Crystal on there. I had to bite through about, I think it was seven or eight sandwiches that were handcrafted by a chef. I can't remember what they called the, the part of the sandwich that you had to show. Um... Damn, I can't remember. So basically at the end of it, I at the end of the commercial, I had to walk in with the sandwich and be taking a bite. But I couldn't just lift it up and bite it. I had to lift it up and show the most perfect side you'd ever seen. Bun, cheese, egg, meat, more bun. Whoa. It was incredible. And no, I didn't eat all seven sandwiches, which I would have, but they provided with me, provided me with a spit cup. So I could take a bite, spit it into a cup that would allow more space in my stomach for another bite that I was going to have to take seven more of. Great crew. The woman that got me the job was named Jax. So shout out to Jax for getting me the Crystal commercial. And I'm not going to say, oh, I made that happen because that would be conceited. But what I did was is they noticed us when we did the Crystal mukbang and then they sent us swag. So I thought, oh, I'll do this video, make the swag. And then I did a, another reel where I was um, – responding to something Ray J was saying. But I, th in my head, I thought, oh, this would be cool if something came of this. Maybe um, I could do some Instagram for work for them or something. 
you know, thinking in my head. And something actually did happen. And again, what do I say? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm getting a message here, folks. I need to look. And it looks mighty important. Oh, it's some Chelsea Ledge sent me a picture of someone wearing a Winnie the Pooh jacket. And I love it. And I'm going to write, holy shit. Holy shit. I love that my friends know me so well that they know that I would see that picture of a guy in a Winnie the Pooh jacket and lose my mind. I'm losing it. It is, in. I'm going to even type incredible. <laughs> I have a new mic stand on the way. If you get irritated with hearing me or seeing me move this, I have a new one on the way. And guess what? I was already supposed to have it because it was delivered. But guess where it was delivered? My house in St. Louis that I don't live at anymore because I entered the wrong address. So my old neighbor, I texted him. I said, would you please go next door and get the package that's out there? Which could have turned out to be dangerous because what if people saw this man going over there and grabbing a package off of a porch that he doesn't live at? And they'd say, hey, what are you doing, guy? And he'd say, I'm grabbing this for a ding-dong that had it sent here that doesn't live here anymore. I have a new mic stand coming. And another mic in case at some point I have three people in here. I don't know. Maybe I'll have a two-piece quartet. And that would just be one half of a quartet. So it wouldn't be a quartet. It would be a duo. What if I have three uh, people that are, um, maybe I'll have a po three groups of politicians. It could happen. Maybe I have three um Maybe aliens land one day, and I want to have an alien on the podcast, but the aliens say, hey, we have another alien that we want to be on the podcast with you, but you don't have enough mics. And I'll say, no, I actually have three mics now, but one is in St. Louis. If you could actually take me in your spaceship to get the other mic, that would be cool. Or maybe you have the technology in your aircraft spacecraft that could allow us to podcast without microphones i don't know i don't know anything about aliens but i'm assuming they have technology that's better than ours and maybe they can fix this microphone stand problem for me because in my mind i'm not going to limit to what i know about technology and alien technology because i don't know alien technology Maybe they have a technology where you just sit here like this. But you're actually doing a podcast and it's recording in an alien's brain. And then they take that footage and put it in my computer. And I don't accidentally delete a file. I don't know. I'm not an alien. And I'm sad I have to say that. Some of you might think I'm an alien. I'm really not an alien. So if that's the case where the alien can just record into their brain or whatever the thing is in their head that makes them think, that's an advanced technology that none of us are able to understand or even visualize. So what if, if I say, hey, it's pretty cold in here, alien. Can you figure your way to warm it up? And he'll say, why don't you just turn your heater on? And I'll be like, you don't guys, ha you guys don't have advanced technologically where you can just heat up a room without putting my heater on. That might be the case. They might be really forward thinking in technology as far as like microphones and microphone stands, but as far as heaters, they don't because maybe on their planet, they don't have a a, a climate problem. Maybe they're, it's not cold or hot ever. It's just regular, and they don't have to get space heaters. Or electric blankets. I don't know. I'm not, as I'm going to say, I'm not an alien. And if you're an alien and you're watching this and you know of a way for me to heat this up that is not a space heater, type it in the comments. 
maybe you don't even have to type it. Maybe you could just send me a message telepathically about how to do it. Imagine you're the man that's in the storage unit next to me doing some kind of very loud work, and you hear me, a woman, not only saying, I can't believe it last time, over and over, but this time you're hearing her talk about alien technology, which would be fine, but then I'm referencing an alien that will telepathically take a message from my brain. (laughs) Oh, you know what the beauty of this insanity is? Is that back in the day, I never would have just talked so freely about what's going on in my brain. Because I didn't want people to know that I... (laughs) That I was absolutely insane. And now I'm okay with that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Stream of consciousness. (laughs) Oh, what am I holding on to this week? I'm holding on to um, the same thing I was last week. Going to be honest with you. Still haven't started writing. But I'm in 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 a better spot where I'm talking to someone about maybe helping be right, helping me uh, organize some stuff, so that's good. Still holding on to that fear of new material. Not good. Not good. Man, I started talking about something, and I switched gears, and, and now I have the thought of what I was going to say after, and man, what a train wreck going on inside my head right now. But I'm going to cut it, uh, I'm going to play one more voicemail and then I'm going to cut it short because i got to use the restroom. A lot of restroom talk today. Let's just play one more little, one, Barbara, let's play one more email. Transcript not available. Man, there's a lot, just so many nice ones, I don't want to. Oh, this was um this was a voicemail I left for myself to just check it. Let's play it. Talk about insanity. Hey storage, it's me, Libby. You. Just um check in check in this voicemail survey. See if it works and how long it works. I'm just gonna keep talking until it tells me I can't talk anymore. So anyway, this one time I was um sitting outside in Smoker's Paradise smoking a cigarette and an actual bear, like a black bear, came up to Smoker's Paradise and he was like, hey, can I bum a cigarette? And I was like, you're a bear. He was like, yeah, I'm a bear, but I smoke. And I was like, okay, I guess I can spot you one. So I gave the bear a cigarette and then the bear was like, hey, um, do you have a lighter? And I'm like, yeah, I have a lighter. It's Smoker's Paradise. So then I handed the bear the lighter, and he couldn't light it on his own because um, he had big claws, like yeah. big bear claws. Yeah, that's so correct. like, do you mind lighting this for me? So I lit the cigarette for the bear, and um, he sat down next to me in Smoker's Paradise, and I'm like, bro, you're a... You're an actual bear. Why aren't you trying to kill me? He's like, man, people got bears all wrong. We're just out here trying to survive just like everybody else. We only kill people when, you know, we have to, when we're threatened. And I was like, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Every time I get out of my car at night, I think a bear is going to come kill me. He's like, no, man, we... We ain't out here trying to kill humans. A deer, on the other hand, we'll kill a deer and eat a deer. But humans, we ain't messing with y'all. <laughs> Daniels was in the window. Listening to uh, Sorry, me. Officer Daniels was just up in the bathroom listening to me recount the story of me and the bear in Smoker's Paradise. And he said, huh? Huh? And um, now I feel foolish. So huh? I'm going to let you go. Um, I'm on about two and a half minutes. It's still going, so that's cool. 
All right. Talk, talk to you later. Bye-bye. There's more. Yeah, Cushing Pound didn't work, so I'm going to go ahead and just hang up. Cushing Pound doesn't work. Don't try it. When you call, don't... Um, don't try to push pound because it doesn't work like you're you're on a beeper in the 90s. So that was another stream of consciousness. Um, that one was about a bear. Don't know where any of that comes from. What I do is, and this is what I learned in improv, I just trust myself and um, I just let it happen. So any normal human being would be like, this is weird. You're talking about a story that didn't happen. And you're just making stuff up. I think that's what we do as comedians and improvisers. So I just let it come out. Now, do I judge it as it's happening? No. I try not to judge it because if I judge it, then I'll stop myself. If I think, oh, this is not good, this is going to be stupid, that's me judging myself and then I'm not able to find little nuggets of funniness in there. Uh, that wasn't necessarily hilarious, but to me, there, there could be some nuggets for maybe a sketch idea or a joke idea. The fact that, uh, a bear came up to me and asked me for a cigarette and then asked me for a lighter <clears throat> because he couldn't light it with his claws. That's not, uh, you know, so hilarious you're rolling on the floor and laughing, but it, again, it could create um, an idea for a sketch or a joke where it might go a different direction. But just imagining a bear and a human sitting together smoking and then the bear's like, hey, we're not really trying to kill people. That's a re that's ridiculous, but also could become something ridiculously funny. And that's how my brain works. Always trying to find these little funny nuggets. The, the part I, I talked about before with the aliens... That just came out of my brain. Was it hilarious? No, but there's something in there that could, could be mined, as they say in improv, where we could take it out of, oh, alien technology is so advanced that we can't comprehend it, and they can actually film and record podcasts without doing anything. So initially, no, that's not hilarious, but something could come of that that could be even more hilarious. And then you bring two more creative people in and you tell them your idea and then maybe they think of a little nugget mind out of there. So the possibilities are endless. What I'm trying to say is if you're an improviser or a comedian, just trust your yourself that something will come out that can be made funny. And that's the lesson for today, folks. And action. All right, well, we're going to play that theme song and get out of here so that I don't mess myself. As my Aunt Ruth said, at the age of 94, when I visited her in um, the, we called it the old folks home, nursing home, um, I, she said, I, I think y'all better go because I done messed my pants. And I haven't forgotten that ever. She done messed her pants. So thanks for everything. Love y'all. this was recording if it wasn't I'm gonna be mad I'm not gonna delete the footage though that's for sure uh-huh.